So um, thanks very much um, for inviting me to this event. I, I appreciate it. Also, thanks to the other presenters. I thought uh, your topics were very interesting and very relevant and um, very much in context with what I'd like to speak about as well. Before I get too far in, uh, I do want to do a little further introduction of the organization that I'm a member of uh, to kind of give some further context. So um, as shared earlier, I'm a member of the API Platforms and Partner Programs Org, A3P, and we are a developer relations team. We do have engineers and business people, and we, we do support not only developer communities, but also private partnerships. And uh, we do have instances within the company where we will work with very large um, uh, companies or customers, or even uh, specific governments to set up their communication systems. And we work with those uh, customers in order to uh, stand up their programs. And in that sense, um, our, our programs aren't necessarily open. We do uh, curate membership. Um, you know, we are a, a mission critical, business critical uh, communications equipment provider. So it's very important that uh, we work with partners who, who understand how um, LAN mobile radios work, uh, how those systems work, and that you know, whatever apps they build um, integrate well and, and don't um, cause issues for our customers. This organization has been around since 2007, and we've been supporting developers attaching applications to uh, our equipment on the edge, our infrastructure, and end-to-end -end systems. And probably the more important thing to, to note here is that uh, we support a developer plus business model. So, uh, you know, that's probably a familiar term uh, to many of you. But to, to understand in, in comparison, um, you know, a lot of companies uh, that provide APIs today, their, their API is their product. So their first customer is the developer. In our case in Motorola, we have our own hardware product, we have our own software services. So that's uh, what we provide to our customers. And we work with partners in order to, uh, as the diagram shows here, add additional value between our hardware, our software, and what our customers expect. To kind of give a, a little bit more information, uh, because um, again, you know, Motorola, we, we provide communication systems. Our, our ecosystem isn't very typical, you know, so here's a, a very simple diagram of what that would look like. You would have your application running on a PC on the left, perhaps connects into a public internet type network, and then to our communication system. And then, um, you know, com communicating wirelessly to devices on the edge. The important thing to note here is that uh, apps are deployed to uh, a network that now includes broadband, but also narrowband. And this narrowband network supports not only data, but also voice. And um, since uh, these systems are used for uh, public safety, first responders, business critical communications, um, it's a shared resource between voice and data. And typically voice has priority over data. And um, for for when data is sent, uh, you know, the, this is the let's say the order of magnitude that we're working with. You know, broadband, you know, tens of megabits, hundreds of megabits of, of, of bandwidth. Uh, for narrow band, we're talking 1.2 kilobit per second max. So, um, you know, comparing it to broadband and 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 public internet, it might as well be infinite um, bandwidth that we're working with. Uh, but with narrowband, there's definitely uh, very specific requirements. And this is the context that we support our developers because, you know, with that, uh, not only do you have to understand our APIs, but also understand uh, what the operational requirements are of the narrowband network. And that actually guides a lot of how we approach uh, API documentation. And, you know, this talk will kind of share with you over this period of time since we first formed as an organization, how that has evolved and where we started, you know, where the things that we encountered that became larger and larger problems and what we have done and are doing in order to uh, address those and work around those. 
So let's talk about some early choices. Um, so as mentioned in the introduction, uh, I am a software engineer, uh, but I also have written technical documentation. And we made a very conscious choice that when we were building this team uh, that would produce these API docs, that they would be um, pulled from uh, our existing community of software developers inside the company. Um, you know, we wanted to uh, have those engineers that actually built the technology which enables the API to be the ones to uh, not only uh, provide training to those developers, uh, answer your questions, you know, be a part of that developer success, but be the ones to write those documents. It, it felt appropriate. It felt uh, really the best way to reduce, you know, having multiple layers of, of knowledge transfer occurring between different teams that perform different uh, functional roles. Uh, we wanted to just encapsulate that into a single organization. In the beginning, uh, because we were a team of software engineers trying to build uh, tech writing skill sets, we uh, you know, certainly adopted and adapted uh, what we call uh, classic uh, project management type methods in order to uh, track our work, define how it should be uh, related to one another in terms of entry and exit criteria and dependencies. And we would you know, plan out our tasks and schedule delivery in that manner. But ultimately our goal was really to you know, provide very comprehensive API documentation. You know, I, I tried to simplify as best, uh, you know, what um, the, the ecosystem was about, but there's just layers of complexity in trying to understand, um, you know, not only how uh, data needs to flow uh, from a broadband, you know, to and from a broadband network and to and from a narrowband network, but what are the um, different uh, use cases you have to handle when interoperating with voice and um, how you need to do perform retries of data and, and different formats. So when we came to really uh, producing our documentation, we want to be absolutely thorough and transfer knowledge about the system um, to the developer, because it, we felt it was very important to have that level of knowledge in order to be uh, successful in building an app for our environment. So, that did lead to some problems, and, and I tried to articulate them right here. Um, when, when building our uh, documentation, we, we try to gather historical data about each and every release of what we would produce. But ultimately, you know, with different releases, different features, uh, working with different teams, the type of historical data that we use to help us estimate um, what it would take to produce this document to build this release just became inaccurate. Um, we would try our best to kind of align schedules, but it was always a, a bit of a struggle to always ensure that we would accomplish it. And certainly when you try to build large project schedules, it, it gets very difficult to maintain. Um, you always have to spend a lot of time trying to uh, keep it up to date. Uh, try to replan when things fall behind or uh, we're ahead or, or scopes change. Um, breaking down the work uh, became um, a job in itself and really highlighted um, what was the complexity in trying to manage those tasks. And when you have this type of um, approach to project planning, ultimately it, it lends itself to be more of a serialized workflow. You know, you have dependencies coming in and out. You know, when do you start this task? When you can't finish this task because you have some critical paths. And when we start looking at um, how we would collaborate with other teams, it, it created a barrier um, of how we could work with them. And I, I try to show, um, you know, uh, an example of what that project schedule looked like. And this is what we used to do in the very beginning. And this is just page one of probably 50 pages of a schedule. And, uh, you know, it was, it was quite painful, uh, but we, it was something that we knew that we couldn't sustain uh, over time and that we need to figure out how to do differently. So in about um, 2016, uh, there were some things that kind of triggered us to 
uh, implement a change. Uh, one was our organization, our, our scope and our responsibilities were, were growing. So we were asked to provide um, a framework, not just with the program that we started to operate, but also with other programs. Um, also the methodologies of, around project management, um, the tools that we use, the resources that we had available that became refocused in the company. So there was just a general uh, ask of the different development teams, uh, whether it's software engineering or even our, our organization as well, um, how to um, execute project management differently. And also at that time, we became more aware of some tooling that allowed us to be a little bit more flexible in how we would manage and define our work. And it was at this point that we started to think about, well, how do we build a platform for developer relations? Um, and we were being comprehensive. Um, not only the experiences in providing, um, helping developers be successful, but also how we would use that platform in order to manage our work as well. So we did select a platform solution that would help us in that. Um, we looked at it as being not only our developer portal, but also our work environments. And, and the key the key capability that we looked toward in this tool was um, using a Kanban board. And once we started using that, uh, it really helped to first uh, align our activities with all the different software engineering teams that we were working with. Those teams were the ones that were responsible for uh, coding and um, realizing the implementation support of the API in the product. And um, we were then able to better align to the different um, you know, sprints and, and the agile development methods that they were using. With that, uh, we, we were able to more effectively um, you know, look at epics, create stories, you know, determine impacts, not only for documentation, but also for tools and training that we also has, have to produce as well. You know, again, you know, the, the team, it, its scope wasn't just technical writing, but all aspects of developer success. So this allowed us to, you know, to be more streamlined in order to accomplish that. And then with that, uh, it allowed us to, to be a little bit more adaptable to how we would execute our work. Whereas in the past, we would try to define an activity of having a, a certain entry criteria or exit criteria, and what were the dependencies in order to accomplish that. Using the Kanban board allows us to just be able to easily reprioritize tasks, shift tasks around. Um, how do we have one person maybe focus on all the different uh, changes that need to be made into a single document as a, as a component? Or do we want that person just to focus on uh, the entire feature as it impacts across multiple APIs? So to allow that flexibility to kind of uh, task differently in order to um, you know, more effectively uh, produce our documentation. And then lastly, with, with the Kanban board, it, it just brought clarity to you know, what was active, what was in the backlog, what else that we needed to do, and ultimately allowed us to, be, uh, to, to, to more effectively execute delivery of um, the documentation as well as other tasks that we were responsible for. So, you know, if you can imagine, you know, moving from a uh, Gantt chart type of uh, project schedule to something that was just simply a Kanban board was um, refreshing, right? It, it actually um, helped us to, to better understand, um, you know, where things were in terms of uh, our development. Here, I just showed an example of what our one of our Kanban boards looked like, right? We, we have, um, you know, we, we use tags and labels in order to categorize all of our different uh, uh, tasks. You know, here we call them issues. Um, we can track them by, you know, what their current state is. Is it work in progress, under review, ready to commit to the repository? You know, those are the gray tags. Uh, the red tags kind of categorize the type of issue it is. Is it an epic? You know, is it uh, something that um, is enhancement? or something that's uh, um, some maintenance work. The green tags here kind of categorize what is the API 
And the purple tags help us to categorize what type of artifact it is. Is it a document? Is it a tool? So here with this kind of flexibility in a Kanban board, we can have different types of filters that help us view different ways uh, of what this looks like, uh, different cuts of information, different reports of information, and rearrange it as, as we needed um, as we would execute through a release. But there were some difficulties in terms of, of creation and consumption that we had to deal with. Um, you know, number one, you know, again, our documentation, it contains specs and narratives. We, we want it to be um, comprehensive um, in the materials that we produce. Uh, one of our key goals, and you may have heard this from the other presenters, is, you know, how do you help the developer to help themselves? Um, being a developer, being a software engineer, it, it's absolutely frustrating, of course, to reach a point in trying to develop software and you feel helpless. Um, and that was something that, um, you know, we were keen to help avoid. So we produce these specifications. We would provide guidance and narratives on how to use these APIs and different use cases. And we would, and the way we would produce them would be to use Microsoft Word. You know, that was the tool of choice at that time. Um, all the teams within the company use that, and that's how we would exchange. Um, you know, these artifacts between different teams for review or um, other activities. And our, our typical workflow in that, in that was just to, you know, write the document, have a review, make some repairs, do a final uh, inspection. And then once everything was ready to go, uh, produce the PDF and release it. But the things that we started to notice from this workflow um, just became uh, more difficult over time. One was, um, you know, not everyone is fully aware of all the different options, all the different ways to configure Word. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do in terms of using Microsoft Word and the flexibility um, of the environment, but that in itself uh, works against you. And one way it works against you is that um, you can have uh, inconsistencies in, in formats. Um, I, I remember many times in, in working with my colleagues how uh, we accidentally used the wrong template versus the other, or we accidentally um, reused the format, although it looks the same, isn't defined the same way. And when you're trying to work within that type of environment um, of the tool, uh, things can break. Um, using uh, a tool like, like Microsoft Word. Um, again, development was very serialized. Only one person can work on that uh, document at the time. And this was before, um, you know, workspaces like Microsoft 365 or something similar. Concurrent work was just not very possible at all because you actually had to wait until someone was done uh, working on that artifact to then check it in before you could check it out and then continue work on it. Um, not only using a, a tool like Word, uh, we would also use other tools to produce different types of resources like um, message sequence charts or specific diagrams. So here we had an instance where we'd have to use yet more tools to produce um, information that we would put together into a document. And then documents just became very large. Um, you know, our APIs have been around since more than 15 years. Uh, we've produced additional enhancements and capabilities within our product. So we're always working to um, add that information into our documentation. But now our documents uh, become large. They, they take long to load. Um, there's chances that uh, these files can get corrupted. And, and those are just risks that we would just rather avoid. And then one thing that we tried to do is as these uh, versions have come out, uh, we try to include a revision history, but the revision history gets quickly out of date because if you try to keep some historical information about what changed in older versions, um, how to locate those changes becomes lost very easily because things just shift around. So we, we tried to focus on what would be a better experience. And, um, you know, there's been much mention of Markdown, not only in 
earlier presentations today, but also in commentary uh, in the chat. But this we felt was a, a appropriate choice. Um, you know, we we looked at Markdown because earlier we were trying to figure out how to produce PDFs in a better way. Um, so that was some information that we used. And then also a very practical thing. Uh, today, uh, when new PCs are deployed, uh, office suites like Microsoft just aren't included. You know, we at our company, we use uh, Google Workspace. Um, so we, we had to come up with a solution of, you know, how as we onboard new team members into the organization that they can still contribute to the uh, documentation uh, creation pipeline. So we did make this choice. We decided that we would go to Markdown. Uh, we did this earlier this year. And even though I saw this comment, you know, is, is Markdown really the best choice? Is, isn't it kind of terrible? Mm, we don't see it that way because we, we looked at other things that were uh, positive trade-offs. Number one, you can say that, oh, you know what? Markdown doesn't have the flexibility in formatting. I think that's good, right? Um, less chance of screwing it up, to be honest. Um, the formats that are um, specified and defined in Markdown are limited. And, um, you know, that helps us. It, we can have a very exact style guide when it comes to uh, laying out our documentation. Um, converting to Markdown, you know, being a text-based format allows us to then break down files uh, into smaller chunks. Uh, one of our largest documents that we still have in, in Microsoft Word PDF format is close to 500 pages. Uh, that's a very large document, too large, in fact, I would say. Uh, but uh, 500 pages in a binary format makes the file even larger, you know, several megabytes, several tens of megabytes. So being able to convert that into Markdown and then break it into smaller uh, logical components makes it easier to work with also allows us to have concurrent development, um, put that file into a uh, version control system like Git, which we absolutely do. Um, and uh, we leverage our you know, DevOps platform in order to accomplish that. Not only for the source control uh, for our internal development, but also in, in the way that uh, we distribute uh, the final version of that product uh, to our developers. Uh, in that, then we have the ability to track issues and it kind of goes into the Kanban board, um, how we do merge requests. So we incorporate that in terms of um, how we review changes and approve them for final release. Um, and then we tag them. Um, when it comes to historical information about how a document is changed with each new version, we can completely avoid having to document a separate uh, revision history. You know, it, it's the documents in Git, right? You can look at the commit history, you can do you can do a diff, you can do a comparison, and that actually brings more clarity to the developer to understand what has changed, what has been added or removed or modified with each new version of our document and each new version of our software, which supports that API. And then other things such as diagrams, um, and we do make uh, extensive use of diagrams in our documentation, especially, especially for message flows. We can take advantage of using Mermaid, which is essentially a, a markdown type language for creating diagrams. And that allows us to, again, um, put that type of documentation under source control. And we've done this for our new documents going forward. Um, and this is not only really improved um, our experience, right, in, in the speed in which we produce our documentation, how we track changes and put them under source control, but also the delivery mechanism as well for our developers. So here's an example of what our documents look like. And, you know, if you didn't really look very hard, they kind of look the same. So, you know, to the question that was brought up earlier, you know, does Markdown kind of look terrible? I don't think so. In fact, I think it actually looks better. Um, if you couldn't tell, the left side is what an original PDF version of our document would look like. And on the right is what the Markdown version looks like. Now, granted, those message flows are still binary images, but we intend to fully replace those with Mermaid code and still have a message sequence chart that 
uh, would just fit right there. But, uh, you know, I think it looks pretty good so far. So then let's talk about the trade-offs and, and the gains. Um, you know, one thing that we had to ask of our developer community was flexibility in uh, working with these new delivery methods and formats of, of documentation. One, it's fully online. Um, in earlier experiences, they would have the ability to, you know, click and download a PDF file and keep it on their laptop um, or their PC. They can still have that experience, but they, they need to accomplish it a different way. You know, they have to clone the repository. Um, they actually have to use a markdown viewer. Uh, in order to see it if they don't want to always be connected online to view it from, from our Git environment. There will be a period of time that we actually have uh, mixed media um, being delivered uh, into our portal, meaning you know, some documentation will be in Markdown, some documentation will still be in PDF form as we slowly transition that. Our workflows will still be mixed as well because we would still have to support both methods. Um, as we you know, try to quickly reduce um, those artifacts that are still in Microsoft Word format. And generally speaking, uh, you know, this will be a technical debt that we anticipate having for at least the next year or so, because um, we still have a lot of documents to work through. But ultimately, um, you know, our goal is to have that completed within uh, a year's time. But the benefits, I think, are, are important here. Uh, one, when it comes to formatting, and what I mean by format depth, you know, for example, it's very easy in a Word document to define your own formats, you know, like a, a one-point heading, like a, 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 um, a single numeral heading, like, you know, section one, right? You know, section 1.1, 1 .1, section 1.1.1, 1 .1 .1. you know, you can continue on and on and on, and, and that's what we started to accidentally do in our documentation. Um, reducing the format depth for readability uh, and having that format uh, be consistent in terms of output became more important uh, in order to make the, the experience of how to consume the documentation you know, faster, easier. Uh, conversion errors, um, you know, in spite of something as straightforward as taking a Microsoft Word document and producing a PDF output, there have been many a times where in reviewing the, the PDF, we'll see broken links, broken hyperlinks. Um, and there's always some kind of a conversion error. Uh, the pagination gets off. Here, you know, working in the uh, format that's not only for um, implementation, but also delivery, just kind of remo removes some of that um, type of unnecessary errors and complications where you just don't have to do any conversion. Uh, documentation becomes robust. The artifacts just become more robust because you don't, you know, the risk of corruption is, is lower, right? We, we fully expect file sizes to be less, right? Being able to open, save, and close becomes a more reliable operation because, you know, there isn't something very large that's being, um, you know, operate on push, pull, clone performance improves because again, your repositories become uh, a little bit more slimmer. And then lastly, um, you know, disk space. You know, that, that's something that we, we actually have to constantly monitor, did, monitor today in terms of our disk space usage. As many of you who use Git know, uh, when you're using it for binaries, which is really not its purpose, uh, but if you do, you know, you're not really, you know, taking advantage of Git, you're actually just producing more artifacts and this just consumes more resources. Shifting to more of a, uh, a text-based format in terms of Markdown helps us to better manage that. But there's still more to do, right? Um, as I stated before, uh, we, we still intend to complete our transition to Markdown. We still have about 30 documents, about 4,000 pages still required to convert. And, and um, our approach there is to use Pandoc uh, for that automated conversion that should uh, reduce or at least minimize the amount of manual effort uh, that we have to um, you know, invest there. We still need to refactor diagrams using Mermaid. 
so that um, now our diagrams are code as well, in addition to our documentation. And we're looking at completing this activity around August of next year. Once we have these things in place, then we can start looking at other things that are, um, uh, you know, I would call more advanced uh, uh, implementations in our pipeline. You know, how do we test our documentation? I think that becomes a very interesting subject that tools like ProseLint or Veil or even Markdown Lint, um, you know, these are, I think, open source. You know, we can incorporate them into a build pipeline to now, uh, you know, standardize on our language, uh, our phrasing. Um, for example, inline expansion of acronyms. I think, you know, those, you know, help with bringing clarity to our documentation uh, and improving the overall experience for our developers. So then kind of, you know, wrapping up, you know, this is how we approached um, evolving the API doc experience. It wasn't just evolving it for our developers that were reading the documentation or would use the documentation, but it was also for ourselves and how we produce it. Um, you know, how do we make it more streamlined, more effective, quicker to deliver, more reliably to deliver, being able to um, match up with the product engineers um, with us as, uh, you know, developer program engineers, being able to use agile methodology in order to execute on our projects and then use, uh, you know, different tools in order to manage our work, you know, in the context of a Kanban board. And then looking at the documentation itself, you know, writing the documents like how we would write code, right? We're all software engineers still on this team. Um, you know, we want to still apply these software engineering type practices, no matter what is it that the artifact is that we're working on. So being able to transform um, our documentation into more code-like formats just helps to not only maintain our skill set, but also kind of do something a little bit more interesting and adjacent um, as a software engineer to, to what we're working on. And then lastly, you know, using these development environments and tools now to, to do source control, but also release manage and automate and deliver uh, to our developer community um, you know, was absolutely part of the experience. So what I'd like to do is uh, say thank you to everyone to listening to my story. Um, hopefully there were some points in there that were interesting and relatable and I'm open to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, while uh, my colleagues are gathering the questions, I'd like to ask how many people's daily or weekly practices uh, or habits were influenced by this change? How many people did you have to involve in turning this ship? Um, well, it wasn't just engineers, um, although that was probably the easier of the two populations. I think uh, the, probably the, the key stakeholder uh, to convince was our business operations people because that you know seemed different right like when you think of a document you think of oh you know there's a tech writing team you produce a document you know it comes on a you know letter size format or a4 size format sheet of paper it has page numbers it has a title you know to see it all online that that's a bit strange uh, so that's one that's one population and then the other population that um requires influence to be receptive to this change is the developer community. But the hope would be it'd be less of a barrier because they are also software engineers. Um, so seeing this, even though it's a document and not a piece of code, should be a relatable experience. But it was still something that you actually have to manage as a change because you know, we're all human. We're used to seeing certain things in a certain way. We have an expectation that if we hear something that's a document that comes in this format. So to try to understand how to 
now consume it when it's delivered differently, you know, that requires some training to overcome. But once it's overcome, then, you know, it, it becomes a little bit more acceptable. You know, I try to point out on my slide deck that when it comes to, well, the revision history. Um, so let me tell a story. Uh, so I mentioned like we have a document that's over 500 pages. The revision history in that document is 10 pages long. And when you have a 10 page long revision history, number one, the oldest revision history is unfindable, right? There's no way to locate it uh, unless you go back to that many versions, you know, that many physical copies of the document to say, oh, oh, that was version 1.0 of the document. Well, luckily I downloaded it. I can go back and see what was changed. Um, to, oh, you don't have to do that anymore. Um, everything's online. It's in a Git repository. You can just look at the commit history and just do a comparison between two versions, and that should tell you exactly what changed. That sounds um, more effective. That sounds easier to locate, but it's the behavior that you actually have to help others to overcome and understand. So that's really mm -hmm. more the barrier, I would say, to adoption of uh, documentation being uh, delivered in a different way than what was expected before. And this is more of a feel or crystal balling in retrospective, but is there a contextual tipping point that you think allowed this? Contextual tipping point. Mm. Pointing fingers at lockdowns and generally the world being upside down, so let's change everything. It Because to me, it feels like it, in retrospective, it may look like a simple decision and then, okay, change. Right. But I think going on, it might have felt like trying to push a ball through a subtle point. Right. I wouldn't say that that the pandemic itself, for example, um, had anything to do with it. This, this was actually a concept that um, was always um, there, right, uh, in the backlog, I would say, for some time. You know, I mentioned that in my presentation, we, we actually had done a proof of concept of, well, you know, how do you produce a PDF document straight from a Word document, uh, but in a, in a build-like manner? Because today, you know, what you do is you go into Microsoft Word, you go print PDF, or you go export PDF. Absolutely functional, but it requires a manual action. And we were investigating how to do that in an automated way, like in a build environment. And in the in the act of doing that, we said, oh, you know, this is interesting. You know, there's Pandoc that could be used in a flow. And, and oh, it, it supports markdown output. So this was something that we had looked at, I would say, four or five years ago, mm -hmm. but could not justify the investment. Because as I stated, we, we have like 4,000 plus pages of documentation, you know, 30, 35 documents that we have to do this for. And, you know, what was the cost benefit analysis? You know, what was the cost benefit of essentially refactoring that amount of content versus just having a different format? And really the trigger point was just the accumulation of the fact that um, our team was growing and it was just not possible to purchase, you know, office suites like Microsoft Word, and we need to, to have, you know, new team members uh, be effective and contribute. And we just took the hard decision. We just got to do it, right? We mm -hmm. just got to do it. That's number one. Number two, it costs us money to uh, store this on disks, you know, in our Git environment, right? So there's a operational expense that we actually have to manage. And, and thirdly, um, the, the experience um, not only for ourselves, right? I mentioned, you know, it, it would take minutes to open files because of the size. You know, there's always a chance that when you hit save, oh, you forgot to plug in your laptop and it shut down right in the middle of saving the document that there would be a, a possibility of corruption or performance issues. Those were things that I would say not one thing was the, the thing that pushed us over, but just the accumulation of all these small things that were just annoyances that when you took them all together, is just not acceptable. And at that point, it was just taking the decision of, okay, let's invest, but invested over time uh, to make this transition. Mm -hmm. 
Anna is asking, um, would you recommend this approach that you talked about uh, for teams with technical and non-technical skills that need to collaborate on documents? In my experience, I would say yes. Um, I think the greatest barrier is, um, you know, if you're using a source control environment like Git, um, that was the biggest barrier, I would say, for the non-technical people. Um, and what helps in that instance is that there's a nice um, uh, solution that kind of packages Git in, you know, a um, well thought out UI, um, easy to understand and, and, and operate. Uh, so, so that was the thing. And, and it, in our case, we were able to train our business people how to use our DevOps platform, right? Mm -hmm. For what they Something need like to do. Something like Git Kraken or, or such a thing you're talking about? Um, so, so not the Git client itself, but you know, for example, a, a, a tool. Kraken, like, I think, like the uh, an octopus. I think is the the logo. I remember. Yeah, Git Kraken is is a Git client for pushing and pulling into repositories. But what I'm talking about is just really the the, the platform itself. So, like a product like uh, GitLab or GitHub mm -hmm. or Atlassian, right? Those are your uh, DevOps platforms, and you know they provide web web interfaces to their Git repositories. And, and that's and, enough? And that's enough, right? Because mm -hmm. what they need to do is one, look at the issue trackers. You know, they are involved in understanding what's the scope of the change and, you know, what is the business impact and uh, what release it goes into. And they are also involved in trying to understand, okay, what are the APIs we should license to our developers? Oh, let me look into the API and see what the documentation looks like. And then once I know that, onboard that developer into that environment. So that's what they need to do. And, and for, for that type of, um, you know, actions, you know, they're, they are able to get it. So, uh, you know, I feel that for non-technical people, you know, whatever platform you choose, if, if they um, build that competency, then yes, this approach can work. Now, for the technical people, the, the key skills that they have to build is technical writing, right? It's different to write a requirements document or um, draft an architecture document versus, versus narrating to someone who's not part of your company culture how to use an API, right? Because I think for all of us, we can understand that for who we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, we have our own language, our own company culture, our, our um, internal understanding of details that we don't have to go and elaborate on. We have to, for, we, we have to remember what it's like to not be that knowledgeable and infuse that right into our documentation. And we saw it as a very important piece because of the nature of our technology. You know, I mentioned that in order to use our APIs effectively, you have to have knowledge of the system. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think there, there's a certain advantage to some other technologies where you can abstract um, knowing the behavior of the ecosystem. And that's not possible with ours. Otherwise, you can come up with a situation where um, when somebody needs to speak verbally in order to communicate the urgency of an emergency situation, but there's an application occupying the channel trying to push through, you know, data that's unimportant, that's, that's a bad thing, right, for our customers. So here, you know, building the skill sets for technical writing is, is a taller challenge, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, engineers were, were trained differently, mm -hmm. just trained differently, but, but, but it's achievable. I think that's the key thing. Mm -hmm. From uh, Jose, a question uh, as I think a, a developer uh, relations team. From what you said, you interact with uh, SMEs from various dev teams to get the info needed to document the API. Are these themes always available to speak with you? Or is it sometimes a challenge to get their attention? If it's a challenge, how do you get them to collaborate with you? Oh, yeah. So first, it's a challenge, uh, no doubt, right? 
because uh, they're busy trying to uh, develop the software for the product. Um, that's number one. Number two, um, you know, Motorola Solutions is a multinational company. So we actually have design centers around the world. Um, you know, I'm based in the United States. I have team members based in Malaysia. I have other team members who are based in the UK. So, you know, time zones are already working against us. Um, so when it comes to collaboration, um, you know, I, I, to be candid, this is where you just kind of go back to your soft skills. How do you influence? How do you uh, build relationships? Um, how do you reduce the friction in which uh, for the activity that uh, you are asking for help on can be done quickly and effectively? You know, so that's really just outside of you know, how we produce API documentation, but just really more of um, you know, how you work with others and, and use those skills in order to influence them to help you. There are um, numerous, numerous <laughs> stories uh, on, on the Writer Docs and the API to Docs stage about how to get people to work with you. Uh, that often includes uh, cookies and chocolate and other sorts of blackmail. Yeah, yeah. Mm. You were talking about uh, tables. How do you manage tables? You were talking about mermaid, so that was answered. Let me quickly read through. In retrospective, would you do something differently in this switch? Mm. Well, you're still yeah. in it. Yeah, it's probably yeah. the hardest part right now, but still. Yeah, that, that, that's hard because, like you said, we're still in the middle of it. We're actually more in the beginning than we are in the middle or the end. Um, if there was one thing I would change, um, it would have been um, looking at these tools earlier in this context um, so that we wouldn't have to um, make as large an investment. I mean, no doubt that the investment that we that we are trying to do right now um, is, a, you know, is large, but it, it didn't have to be so large. Um, probably the other thing I would have done is just, uh, <laughs> just done it and, and asked for forgiveness later, uh, you know, <laughs> because sometimes that that's what needs to be done. Um, you know, I, I've, I've, um, participated in some other talks and in, in other, in other topics where, um, you know, that's that's um, that's part of managing risk, right? Um, because no matter what you do, there, there's going to be risk involved. You know, there's going to be um, a risk in in your you know how much capacity you have in order to do other things. There's going to be a risk of um, you know uh, being able to complete the work in a timely manner. But then there's also risk of you know what you don't have as a preferred experience if you don't you know take this chance as well and that's probably the, the thing in hindsight where um it felt like the right thing um and really the only way to know if it was the right thing was just to do it mm -hmm. and i'm glad they were doing it now um it's just that now we actually have some effort that we have to work through in order to, to finish it off mm -hmm. any aspect of the story that you told that you would so the opposite question that you would really recommend because that specific aspect you do you think that you did really well like if even if you don't take the rest that's a good idea mm. um i'm putting you on a spot a little bit yeah here. i know that that's a hard question but it's also interesting you're asking something that you know a topic that i haven't had a chance to really wonder about but if i were to look back at it um I think today, right, what we do very well is um, one, um, have, have, you know, taking so taking software engineers that can rely on their um, product knowledge to share that knowledge um, as educators, as authors, as um, 
subject matter experts that um, you can go ask a question of and get an answer of from. And, um, you know, with that, um, then still treat that organization as a team of software engineers. So today, right, we, we finally figured out how to most effectively work with our product engineering teams by appropriately adapting a job methods to some work product that maybe at first glance, you wouldn't say that that's software development, right? But in looking at our documentation, we, you know, I know I absolutely view that as a software development. It's just, it's just a different format, but it's really the principles, the tools, the, the techniques that you apply that make it software development. And, you know, that's the thing I would say I would take away from, um, you know, making this change that's been positive, that's um, been more of a, a, a help than a hindrance um, looking back. And, um, you, you know, it, you know, I, I would say the only thing I'm remiss about is that we hadn't taken the action sooner to recognize that uh, mm -hmm. at the beginning when we first formed as a team. Because in the beginning, we just viewed as ourselves as, oh, we're just software engineers that, that have very solid product knowledge, but now we're going to be a team of technical writers mm -hmm. and, and support people for uh, developers outside the company. And um, if we, and that's just not the case, right? We are still a team of engineers doing software engineering things, and and there's no reason why we can't use the same tools and techniques as any other software engineering team uh, in the company or in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hear different versions of what you just said uh, from uh, from uh, decorating teams, the rel teams that I ask about this. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, as closure, is there a question that you wish somebody asked you, but we didn't? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I'd be afraid to to bring it up because then somebody would really want to know. So I think I'll just leave that as it is. Is there a way people are allowed to contact you if they would like to take up their contact with you? Yeah, so um, if it's okay, I, I did share my LinkedIn. Um, I can type it into the chat right now uh, so that everyone has it. Uh, feel free to contact me that way. 